because tonight's video runs a little bit longer than uh, than normal, and so it's going to spill over into our break just a little bit. Uh, so, um, uh, but not too much. So, uh, want to give that as much time as possible. So. Apologize for the mix-up a couple of Wednesday nights ago when we were at camp. Um, uh, communication problem that I'll bear complete responsibility for. Um, but uh, things should be working fine tonight. And we're glad you're here. We're watching this video series uh, on Wednesday nights this summer. And it's pretty much self-explanatory. You can see the title. And, uh, and so if you're visiting tonight, thank you for being here and hope that we all benefit from the video. Okay, Andy, start it up. In our discussion of whether or not the Bible has been corrupted, we now turn our attention to the question, how did the transmission process proceed? Well, think for just a moment how... As soon as the New Testament books were handwritten by the inspired apostles, those would have been very quickly copied by individual Christians who had the motivation to have a copy of a, an inspired New Testament book. This would have continued for many years because Christianity was persecuted. It was uh, an illicit religion in the Roman Empire, and therefore it would have depended upon its own members, to propagate the transmission of the New Testament text. Coming down to about the fourth century, however, the Roman Empire offered its official sanction of the Christian religion. Now you see the transmission of the text would have taken on a whole new approach. In fact, commercial book manufacturers would have been established and they would have had rooms known as uh, scriptoria where they would have trained professional scribes, both Christian and non-Christian, who would work at those book manufacturers and they would sit in a scriptorium and they would listen to a lector. A lector would be an individual who would stand up at the front and who would read the text of a particular New Testament book. All of the individuals uh, sitting in the scriptorium would then simultaneously write down what was being said. As a result, you would have numerous copies of a particular book of the New Testament produced simultaneously. However, associated with that process would have been a tendency for errors of hearing. Because you see, if you're listening to someone read you the New Testament and you're trying to write it down, it would have been easy for someone next to you to cough and partially obscure the sound of the reader. You might yourself have a momentary distraction. Uh, when you're listening to the person reading, you know there are words that, are, that we call homonyms, words that have different meanings but they in fact sound the same. All of that began to occur in the fourth century. Now by the fifth century, another significant change occurred in history. Church historians call this period the period of monasticism. This was a period in which monks would go out into uninhabited areas, desert regions, and build monasteries. They then took on the responsibility of making copies of New Testament books and they would typically go individually into their own cell, a separate cell, less pressure, notice, than the commercial book uh, scriptorium, but you have a whole new uh, category of problems associated with an individual making copies by himself. Notice that for an individual to sit down and to make a copy of another book, there are at least four distinct operations that occur. First, the person would have to look at the original and read the line or phrase that he's going to copy to himself. He then has to retain that phrase or line in, in his memory. He then, in turning to the copy that he's going to make of that, he must dictate that back to himself, either silently or aloud, 
And then there's the final action of actually engaging his hand to write what it is that he is copying. So there are four distinct operations that occur in the process of making a copy of an original or of a parent manuscript. Well, that, that gives leeway for errors primarily of the mind. And we'll be looking at some of those momentarily. And then there's also the physiological errors that can result. What do we mean by that? Well, it's very taxing to the body physically, very arduous and fatiguing. Uh, typically, uh, these monks would uh, stand perhaps at, at a lar or tall podium of some sort. Others simply sat on a stool and held the original manuscript in his lap and then would write as he was doing so. Uh, he might sit on the ground. Uh, the, the concept of desk seated at a comfortable desk was not really very prominent at this point in history. So there would be opportunities for errors due to fatigue, due to errors of the mind. Now when we say that no two manuscripts are alike, what do we mean by that? How do they differ? What kinds of errors are we talking about? You see, the skeptics take these statements, well, no two manuscripts are alike, and really lather that up and make it seem as if there's no way we can know what the New Testament read. Well, that's simply not true. When a person examines the kinds of errors that occur in these manuscripts, he or she can very quickly sort out precisely what has happened. I'd like for us to look at some of these errors, and we will categorize them the way scholars typically do, so that we can classify them and understand what we're talking about. Let's begin with the broad category of unintentional errors. Errors that happen unintentionally, accidentally by the scribe who is making the copy. Under this general category of unintentional errors, we have those errors that pertain to the eyes. Errors due to eyesight. Well, how, how would that happen? Well, some Greek letters look alike in the same way that English letters can look alike. You know, an O and an A differ very, very slightly in appearance. The A just has an extra little uh, tail that distinguishes it. Uh, the letter I and the small letter L can look very much alike, especially depending upon how a person's handwriting is done. And notice that all of these manuscripts that have the errors to which we're referring have to do with handwritten efforts on the part of individuals. Some people make their letters look a little bit different than the next person. And therefore, there's lots of room for letters that are very close in their appearance to be confused and transposed with other errors. Let me give you some examples of this in English. If you were to write on a piece of paper the word most and then write the word lost, those two words differ only in one letter and yet have a, much, a great deal of difference in meaning. Take the three English words, in fact, write them one above the other on a piece of paper to really emphasize this in your mind. Take the word comb, the word tomb, and the word bomb. There are three different words. They differ with each other only in one letter, and yet again have radically different meanings. What about the word naked and the word baked? Differing only in one letter, and yet very different in meaning. Well, that's the case in Greek. There are many Greek letters that look alike. For example, the capital D, delta, and the capital L, lambda. And you know that this visual comparison, they look so much alike that in one manuscript in Acts chapter 15, verse 40, it makes the difference in the wording or translation having chosen versus having received. And then you have uh, the three Greek capital letters, sigma, Theta and Omicron. All of those are very circular and look uh, very similar and would be subject to being confused. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that would make the difference if you had a Omicron and a Sigma in capital letters, that would be translated he who. But if you had a Theta and a Sigma together, that would be a shortened form of God. So he who versus God, 1 Timothy 3.16, manuscript evidence shows that confusion. 
Then you have the two Greek letters, lambda iota, L-I, look very much like the single Greek letter, nu. Well, manuscripts show confusion here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, which makes the difference in translation between the English word scarcely and the English word really. Then you have the gamma and the Greek letter for P, pi, P, and then the T, tau. Uh, when a gamma and a P or pi are put together, when the pi and the tau are put together, they look very much alike. And in the manuscript evidence, this confusion is apparent in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, which makes the difference in translation deceptions as opposed to love feasts. So one way that unintentional errors have crept into the manuscripts is because some Greek letters look alike. Another error of eyesight is when two lines in a manuscript end with the same word or phrase. For example, in Codex Vaticanus, in John chapter 17, verse 15, the, the, the passage reads, I do not pray that you should take them from the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Did you notice those two parallel phrases, them from the? The uh, scholars have terms that they use to describe these phenomena. Homeotolutin is the term used to refer to similar ending lines at the edge of a paragraph. Parablepsis, which literally means a looking to the side, has to do with the repetition of those expressions. So, if you were to take John 17 verse 15 and arrange the words where you have them from thee at the end of each line, and I'll put this on the screen for you so you can see how that turns out. I do not pray that you should take them from the autus ec tu, them from the world. But So notice if a scribe is working on that first line and he stops with the first line, he looks over and writes that down. Then his eyes come back to the original, but instead of picking up where he left off, he dropped down to the next line that also ends with the words autusec to, from, them from thee. Notice then that the uh, several words, in fact the words world, but that you should keep, would be omitted from his manuscript. And there would be no way to, for later copies of that manuscript to recover that, those lost words. However, the massive amount of manuscript that we have have, been, have enabled scholars to understand exactly what happened in that situation. Here's another case of this very same phenomenon. Luke chapter 10, verse 32. In Codex Sinaiticus, uh, the same thing happened. Verse 32 ends with the same verb as the previous sentence in verse 31. And so the words passed by on the other side are repeated uh, in verse 31 and in verse 32. Well, the uh, fellow that was copying, making the copy of that we call Codex Sinaiticus uh, obviously jumped from the first phrase to the second phrase and thereby left out everything in between. Another example of such an error is found in Codex Alexandrinus at 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 2. You might want to look at each of these passages just so you can see specifically what we're talking about. But notice that verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 9 ends in the words, In the Lord. There's actually four words in the original language. You are in the Lord. Verse 2 ends with those same four words. So the scribe that made Codex Alexandrinus was looking at verse 1. He looked away to write those words down. When he looked back, instead of coming back to the end of verse 1, he came back to the end of verse 2 and proceeded with verse 3, thus literally leaving out an entire verse. Another example is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Here we have um, a passage that is omitted in more than 12 manuscripts. Because you see verse 26 ends with the five words in Greek, translated, cannot be my disciple. But notice that verse 27 has those same words at the end of that verse. Consequently, uh, we, we understand perfectly why this omission occurred. Let me give you another example. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, 
The second clause in that verse is omitted in later manuscripts. It is a phrase that is translated, has the Father. And one can again see that this uh, repetition of these two phrases caused the intervening words to be omitted. Here is another example of the kind of errors that we're talking about. In Acts chapter 19, verse 34, in Codex Vaticanus, the cry of the mob in the city of Ephesus is actually repeated twice. It's given twice in Codex Vaticanus when all the, the rest of the manuscript evidence suggests that uh, when Luke wrote Acts, he only mentioned that cry, great is Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians, that he actually only made that statement once. This kind of error is called ditography because the scribe's eyes picked up the same words a second time and he repeated them not realizing that he was repeating the same words that he had already written. Now, I want you to notice before we go any further that when we look, we get right down to brass tacks, we get down to the nitty gritty and look at these so-called errors, these so-called differences, these textual variants. We, we soon realize that the solutions to these differences are detectable. We don't have any trouble figuring out what happened and why those crept into the manuscripts. You can understand exactly why they occurred and thereby determine what the original reading was. But, but even if we were not able to do that, notice that all these examples that I've given you, and there are many of these, they do not affect any doctrinal matter. All right, those are unintentional errors due to eyesight. Let's turn to unintentional errors due to hearing. Now, these would have crept into the manuscripts during that period when manuscripts were being made by listening to a lector who would read the passage and then individuals listening would write it down. One error of hearing is when different words that sound the same but have different spellings are confused by the scribe who is making the copy. Let me give you some examples in English. Uh, we typically call these homonyms. What about the word great, G-R-E-A-T, and the word great, G-R-A-T-E? What about the word there, T-H-E-I-R, meaning referring to specific persons, their, their box, versus T-H-E-R-E, -E, where you're pointing a direction, go there. What about the word deer, D-E-A-R, versus deer, D-E-E-R, referring to an animal? Well, those have very different meanings, but they sound the same. So different words can sound the same, but have different spellings. And vowels, diphthongs, and consonants oftentimes sounded alike in Greek, even as we have the same in English. Let me give you a few examples. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1 where the Greek letters O, Omicron, and Omega apparently sounded alike. And so in Romans 5.1, you have the word echoman with the O sound being an Omicron, and you have the word echoman with the O sound being Omega. Those sound exactly the same, but the first echoman should have been translated, we have, uh, the second is, a, is an appeal, let us have. Well, not much difference in those, but very clearly the result of failing to understand two different words were being used. The same may be said of a number of words or letters and diphthongs in Greek. Uh, the A-I and the E, the Epsilon, sounded alike. Uh, the Eta, Iota, and Upsilon oftentimes could be confused with the diphthongs, E-I, O-I, and U-I. The O-U sound was the same as simply the U sound. Let me give you a great example. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. If you were to pick up your uh, King James, New King James, and read Revelation 1, 5, you would find these words, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, the Greek word translated washed us is lusanti, L-O-U. S-A-N-T-I, Lusanti. But if you were to pick up an American Standard Version, an English Standard Version, most of the newer versions, you would find the passage translated, unto him that loved us and loosed us, or the ESV has freed us. I think one translation has released us. You see, those translations are all basing their translation on another Greek word, 
Lusanti, which sounds exactly like the previous word. But instead of L-O-U, it is simply L-U, which is the word for loose or release. Well, you can see clearly how that confusion came as a result of an, an auditory, a hearing error. And by examining sufficient number of manuscripts, taking into account a number of um, factors, one can determine which of those is the proper reading. Here's another example. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, you have the Greek word nikos, N-I-K-O-S, nikos, which is uh, translated victory. In P46, that's a papyrus, and in Vaticanus, Codex Vaticanus, you actually have the word nikos, N-E-I-K-O-S, which sounds the same as the word for victory, but it's actually the word for conflict. So rather than death is swallowed up in victory, which is clearly the proper reading that Paul uh, himself wrote, it is uh, in those two manuscripts translated or, or uses the Greek word for conflict. So many of the errors that can be examined uh, immediately on the surface show themselves to be an error because they conflict with the context itself. That's the internal evidence which we'll look at in this study. What about Revelation chapter 4 verse 3? You have the normal Greek word there for rainbow, and the normal Greek word for priests sounds very close to the uh, pronunciation of the word for rainbow. Well, in Sinaiticus, Codex Sinaiticus, which is a prestigious uh, manuscript, and Alexandrinus and others, you have, uh, instead of priests, you have rainbow. There was a rainbow around the throne, and uh, I'm sorry, the... Uh, the translation priests is found in Alexandrinus, Sidiaticus, and others. And so instead of rainbow, they have the word for priest. Well, that is a hearing of the ears. Also, consonants could sound alike and be confused when a, a particular scribe was sitting there listening to the reading of the text. For example, you can imagine a lector reading Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. And in that passage, you have the Greek words ek, su. But notice when we read, even in our own language or speak out loud, we kind of run things together. So ek, su is ek, su. That should be translated from you. But it would be very easy to confuse that with the Greek letter ek, z instead of the kappa, the k. And therefore, to write ex u, which would be translated from whom or from which. And this is actually found in Codex Sidionicus, but a corrector came along and uh, corrected and changed it to ex su. Now notice how these two sound the same, ex su, ex su, and ex su, ex u. That's a hearing that, uh, that is an error that came about as a result of hearing. A similar example found in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. Now, I realize this is tedious, is it not? <laughs> to sit here and go through these, but you have to look at these in order to understand the errors that we're talking about. And in order to conclude, when people say, oh, the Bible's filled with errors, so you can't know what the Bible reads, well, those people are speaking in ignorance. That's simply not the case. These errors are detectable. They are decipherable. So look at 1 Thessalonians 2.7, where we have two Greek words that can be translated, we were gentle. The way the first letter ends and the way this, I mean the first word ends and the way the second word begins, those two letters can be run together in such a way that you could easily understand the lector to be saying, we were babes. So one translation has, we were gentle among you. Another translation has, we were babes. Well, that is a hearing error. Here's another one in Revelation chapter 15, verse 6. We have the Greek word linon, that's our English word linen, and the Greek word lithon, which is the normal Greek word for stone. Well, in Alexandrinus, the Latin Vulgate, and other, other manuscripts, there is a distinction there where they translate it stone. These uh, seven angels are clothed in pure, bright linen in most translations, but, or most manuscripts, but in these particular manuscripts, it's 
they actually inserted that these angels were clothed in pure, bright stone. So that's interesting. Of course, that text is very figurative anyways. And notice again that there's not any major concern here as far as making certain that we know our Bibles and that we know how to get to heaven. What about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11? The Greek word for truth, aletheus. The Greek word for disobedience, apatheus. In Codex Claremontanus, they have disobedience rather than truth. In, if, in Hebrews 4.11, where we are told if anyone falls according to the same example of disobedience as opposed to truth. So that too is a hearing error, an error that's unintentional, but the scribe is going with what he thought he heard. Another unintentional error has to do with errors of the mind. You know, you can't hardly sit down and write a letter to someone or if you're sitting down wanting to copy what somebody else wrote. If you'll do that very much, you will soon realize very quickly that you are susceptible to making errors of the mind, mental errors. For example, the substitution of synonyms, words that mean the same thing. There are a lot of these in the Greek manuscripts that show that the scribe was relying upon his memory. He was thinking of the concept rather than the word itself. And therefore, he wrote a different word, even though it had basically the same meaning. So, for example, uh, apen for uh, ethe, that's the word for to speak as opposed to say. You have apo for ek, that's the Greek preposition away from instead of the Greek preposition out of. You have uh, hoti versus dot. Uh, the difference in those words in English would be that versus because. You have uh, peri and huper. Uh, the difference being about or concerning. And you know, there are two different Greek words for the eye. There's the omaton or the ophthalmon, from which we get ophthalmology, for example. Well, it'd be easy for a scribe who's copying a manuscript that has one of those words for eye. When he turns over and starts writing uh, that sentence, he's liable to insert another word for eye because it means the same thing and he's not, his mind is not cluing in to the specific synonym that actually was given. Other errors of the mind include those that have to do with varied word order. For example, in Mark chapter 1, verse 5, you have um, a phrase that can create confusion because of word order. The passage actually says, There went out unto them um, all the country of Judea and all they of Jerusalem and they were baptized of him in the river Jordan. Now, if you take the Greek word for all, pontes, and the Greek conjunction chi, and the, um, the verb for baptism, ebaptizonto, were baptized. In that order, the sentence would end with the word all, there'd be a semicolon there, and then continue with and were baptized. But if you have chi before ebaptizonto and pontes, or if you have chi with pontes ebaptizonto, ebaptizonto, then you have a different wording. So notice, in Mark chapter 1, verse 5, the American Standard has, they went unto him all the country of Judea and all they of Jerusalem, and they were baptized of him. But if you look at, for example, the New King James, you have all the land of Judah and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River. So it's the difference between all they of Jerusalem came out and then they were baptized, or it's they came out of Jerusalem and then all of them were baptized. That's the distinction. Well, is that a significant distinction? Does that mean we don't have our Bible? We don't know what the Bible reads? We now have doctrinal confusion and we, we can't be acceptable to God? Of course not. These aren't that serious. And they've been blown up by those who have an agenda. They blow this up into something far more than it is and then make brash, broad statements. Oh, the Bible's filled with errors. 50,000, we can't know the truth. That's simply not true. And I'm proving it to you. Let's go further. Errors of the mind can have to do with letters that are transposed. For example, in Mark chapter 14, verse 65, we have... Uh, this statement about the uh, individuals who began to spit upon Jesus, to cover uh, His face, to buffet Him, to say unto Him, prophesy, uh, and the officers received Him, 
with blows of their hands. That's the way the American standard reads. That's the way the English, English standard reads and others. That would be the word uh, elebone. But listen carefully. If instead of elebone, the scribe had written ebalone, in other words, he transposed the B and the L, the beta and the lambda. And uh, ebalone can also occur in two different forms, having the same basic meaning, to throw or to cast or to assault. But it, it's the difference in aorist active versus imperfect active. Both of those sound the same, ebalone, ebalone. Consequently, if you were to look in a New King James Bible, for example, the last phrase reads that the officer struck him with the palms of their hands, as opposed to the officers received him with blows of their hands. There's the difference in those two translations, and the reason is because of the transposition of letters. A fourth error of the mind involves assimilation of wording. And this is very common in the manuscript uh, evidence that is available to us. Look, for example, this can be a little bit complicated, but we can, we can make sense of it. If you were to go to the King James Version and read Matthew 19, 17, you would find these words, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. If you then go to the American Standard Version, you would read, Why askest thou me concerning that which is good? One there is who is God. Well, the American Standard is representing the manuscript evidence properly. You see, scribes who were very used to copying the synoptics, that term refers to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why are the why are the first three gospel records referred to as synoptics? Well, synoptic is from a Greek word, soon, with, and optics to see. So they see with, they see together. You'll find things in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are parallel to each other. Lots of parallels as opposed to John. So they're called the synoptics. Well, imagine a scribe who is very familiar with the wording, let's say, of Luke. And he's copied that so many times, he can pretty much re-quote it to you regurgitate it without even looking at it. And then he's called upon to make a copy, let's say, of Matthew or Mark. Well, he's so familiar with the wording of Luke that he's liable to put that exact wording over into Matthew or Mark where the same verse or passage is being alluded to. And we find many instances of this and therefore can understand what is happening. In this particular case, in Matthew 19, verse 17, it is obvious that the the copyist assimilated Matthew 19, 17 from the wording of Mark chapter 10, verse 18. That's where that wording came from, and that's where it is authentic. Let me give you another excellent example to illustrate this particular error of the mind, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. The King James Version reads, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood." even the forgiveness of sins. But if you look at the American Standard, the English Standard, and most of the newer versions, you'll find that that phrase, through His blood, is not in Colossians 1.14. In whom we have our redemption, through His blood. Now, does it matter whether it's there or not? Well, it doesn't because we know the Bible elsewhere teaches that our redemption comes through the blood of Christ. In fact, that exact phrase is used in the parallel in the book of Ephesians. You know, Colossians and Ephesians are kind of parallel volumes, and they too have overlaps similar to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you were to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the manuscript evidence clearly shows that the use of the phrase, through His blood, is authentic in Ephesians 1, verse 7. But it is not in Colossians 1, 14. So obviously there was a scribe that was so familiar with Ephesians 1.7 and the phrase, through His blood, that when he was called upon to make a copy of Colossians, he inserted through His blood because he was so familiar with Ephesians 1.7 and it fit exactly in that spot in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. That is an error of the mind. Yet another type of unintentional error are errors in judgment. What do we mean by that? Well, <clears throat> scribal glosses would often result in corrections in a text. Let's say a scribe 
is very familiar with a passage and he's making a copy and he finds something that he thinks either needs to be commented on or corrected. He would often write out in the margin of the copy that he's making a little comment or a statement. You know, you'll do that if you're writing something and you realize, oh, I meant to put this in, and so you'll make a little V, upside down V, and insert a word or two so that the reader knows that's supposed to go there. Well, we find these glosses, they're called, in various manuscripts of the New Testament. And here's one of the things that would occur when these glosses were made. A gloss being a brief explanatory note or translation of a difficult or technical expression and therefore usually added by the, the copyist or the editor that's trying to insert that and, and add that to that. You see these marginal notes were sometimes t taken to be actual portions of the text. And therefore, here's a scribe, he's wanting to make a copy of this manuscript. He sees the gloss out in the margin or maybe between the lines. And he's thinking, now wait a minute, does this... Is this supposed to be in the original text of the New Testament? I don't want to leave it out. If it is, then I'll be responsible for making a copy that eliminates a portion of God's Word. So it was very easy for scribes to simply insert the gloss into the text of the copy that he was making. Scholars speculate this might be what happened in John chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. If you'll examine uh, our older versions, you will find uh, a number of words there that talk about this circumstance in which this poor fellow that was uh, lame and, and so forth, and he was lying there, and the text then goes off and talks about how an angel would come every so often and trouble the waters, and it was like the first one that could get in there would be healed, and everybody else was pretty much out of luck. Notice the way that's worded in the older versions. Uh, the author of the book of John seems to be endorsing that mythology, the idea that, that an angel would do such a thing. But if you look at the best manuscript evidence, it becomes apparent that, that that's not there. So John 5, 3b, the last half of verse 3 and all of verse 4, is omitted in all versions beginning with the American standard. It's relegated to a footnote or brackets or some indication that its, uh, its authenticity is questioned. Well, how did it get in there? Well, because if you read the text unadorned, it would leave the writer wonder, or the reader wondering why these people were lying around this pool. What were they waiting for? And so it's thought that perhaps a scribe attempted to give an explanation for the invalid lying there by the Bethesda pool. And then a later scribe came along, saw this marginal comment, and then incorporated it into the text, uh, thinking that it was part of the Word of God. Things like that can happen in the manuscript tradition. Let me take you now to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Here's another excellent example uh, how these things can occur. Errors of judgment. You remember that passage reads, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, the King James Version, and I believe the New, America, uh, the New King James, inserts the phrase, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, is that in the original book of Romans that Paul wrote? Well, the manuscript evidence suggests it is not. Well, then how did it get there? Well, it was probably originally an explanatory note that a scribe wrote, inserted. Well, why would he dare to do that? because those very words occur three verses later in verse 4. So it would be easy to insert them in verse 1 to make sure that the reader is not confused before the reader gets down to verse 4. We'll try to show you some of the manuscript evidence on that. What about Luke chapter 7 and verse 31? We have initiating that verse the words, Apen o curios, and the Lord said... Well, do you realize that those lectionaries that we talked about earlier, these were books containing Scripture readings, blocks of Scripture that would coincide with the ecclesiastical calendar. They would be used for public reading of Scripture. In fact, they had them dated. Here's what you're to read on Sunday, you know, June 14th. Here's what you're to read on 
Sunday, June 21st. And you can look at these and, and gather a great deal of uh, evidence for the way the New Testament read at the very beginning. Well, typically, in a lecture, in a lectionary reading, they would also insert before each block of text those three words, apen ho curios, and the Lord said. So they wanted the reader to come up there and to announce to the congregation, and the Lord said, and then read the content. Well, do you see it would be very easy then for a later scribe to insert that little expression, that formula, thinking that that was part of the original text. And that's the case in Luke chapter 7 and verse 31. Another example is found in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 4. There the uh, phrase, uh, the, the passage reads, "...praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints." Several minuscules, those are those later manuscripts that are further away from the original New Testament, they have after the phrase, to the saints, a gloss. Translated, we receive. Dekosthai hemos, we receive. It's thought that a scribe of one of these manuscripts wrote in the margin after he, when he got a hold of this copy, and after the words, to the saints, there was this, we receive. The scribe of one of those manuscripts wrote in the margin, as it is found, it is found thus in many of the copies. So he's clearly giving his justification for why he put the words, we receive. A later scribe comes along, sees that comment, for thus it is written in many of the copies, thinking that that is part of the text, and he inserts it into his copy of 2 Corinthians. He doesn't put it out of the margin. He puts it in the text as if it is part of it. Well, you know, copious textual critics can easily see what's happened there and get maybe a little smile at how that confusion could come about. I don't want to give the impression that copyists were very negligent and very uh, slipshod in what they, they did. The historical evidence verifies that they were very careful. But every so often, someone might make a, a major, major mistake. And that's certainly the case in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 uh, through 38. You have there a listing of the genealogies. And the copyist of the manuscript Codex 109, which is a fourth, 14th century minuscule that's that's located today in the British Museum. Many of the, of the manuscripts of the New Testament are written in columns, and so a single page will have two columns. You're supposed to go down the first column and then move up to the top of the second column and follow that down and read it. Well, it is apparent in this particular codex that what the uh, scribe did was he copied the first line of the first column and then went right on across to the second line, or to the second column, and copied the first line of that, and did so all the way down. Well, it becomes apparent immediately that this fellow was asleep, half asleep, because that would cause this listing of genealogies to make everyone the son of the wrong father, and instead of Adam, uh, and then Adam being the son of God, you have God is the son of Aram, and the source of the human race is fairy. So that's a really extreme instance or example of scribal error that was unintentional. You know, he was not trying to, to uh, destroy the New Testament or corrupt it. And uh, what he did was a, was a mistake and it's easily identifiable. Notice again, the solutions to these differences are detectable. And even if they weren't, they do not affect any doctrinal matter. In our next session together, we'll look at some more of these types of errors. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the...